Aloha, welcome to NOAA Live. I am Nicole Bartlett and I'm gonna be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the 26th webinar and the ninth week in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, that's N-O-A-A, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, I'm so happy to introduce you to Keith Kamikawa with NOAA Fisheries Pacific Islands Regional Office in Honolulu, Hawaii. I used to live in Honolulu, actually Mililani on the island of Oahu, which is why I'm representing with my flower today. No orchids to be found in Mashpee. <laughs> So I'm doing my best, Keith. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in understanding fisheries habitat, we want to recognize that we are coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Keith is coming to us from the ancestral Hawaiian lands and seas, and we're hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions. A lot of you have found that box already to let us know where you're coming in from. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I'll be keeping track for Keith. We're going to stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all of your questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, Keith, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Nicole. So yes, as she mentioned, my name is Keith and I'm a contractor with Linker Technologies at NOAA's Pacific Islands Regional Office in the Habitat Conservation Division. And part of my duties, I often do education and outreach. And we found that a lot of folks associate NOAA with just the weather or don't know about the other amazing work they do. So I have a, a short video that we'd like to show to really showcase what uh, the, the variety of work that NOAA covers. Making me homesick, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I just wanted to take a moment and share with what share with you what I do on my for my day to day job. So as a fisheries extension agent, I serve as somewhat of a middleman or the interface or a bridge, you know, between different groups. And so these groups are the scientific community. These are folks that are out in the field, you know, they're studying the fishes, they're studying coral and the ocean. And then I also work with the management community, and this includes NOAA or 
our state agencies like the Division of Aquatic Resources, and they deal with the rules and regulations. And then I also, of course, deal with the fishing community. And these are folks that are accessing the resource. So they're maybe fishing from a boat or fishing from shore or a spear fisher that's out diving. And the problem is that sometimes there's some mistrust or poor communication between these different groups. So it's my job to be in the middle here and help information flow between these different groups. And sometimes there's even obstacles to getting some good work done. So I help to break down those obstacles and make sure that there's good productivity. Now, I just wanna hop right in and introduce the, the species that we're gonna be talking about today that you saw in the title slide. So there are two species of bonefishes in Hawaii. We, we call them Oio here. We've got one on the left and one on the right. And so as you can see, they look pretty similar. And there's definitely some differences that I'll talk about in a little bit. But the one on the right is actually found only in Hawaii, meaning it's endemic. So it's there's bonefishes all over the world in different warm seas, but this one here is found only in Oahu. And so I mentioned they look really similar, right, when you're looking at them from the side. But one of the main distinguish, distinguishing characteristics is the shape of their jaw. And so as you can see here, the one on the left is round. And its common name is the round jaw. And the one on the right is the sharp jaw, and it's a bit more pointed. So the sharp jaws also have a yellow dot near their pectoral fin on the side, but this is the main, most reliable way to distinguish between these two species. And so bonefishes have been an important fish since early Hawaiian days. They were raised in fish ponds, such as the one, example of one here on, in Hi'ia on the eastern end of Oahu, but they were also used for ceremonies and for offerings, and of course, an important source of food. And I'd like to convince you that they are still, bonefishes are still very much important today. The, one of the main reasons is that they're really fun to catch. So they are, they are an important recreational or non-commercial species. And that's because they're really fast, they're really strong, and they're really smart. So they are uh, species that people really like to target. And then there are folks that actually like to do it for citizen science, where they'll actually catch a bonefish, They'll measure it and tag it. And I'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation. But perhaps the more widespread use for bonefishes is for as a source of food. And so some people like to eat the meat raw. This is a picture of the raw meat, but they'll actually mix a lot of different ingredients in here. And it's called lomi oio. Or there are people that like to eat it in a fish cake form or a fish ball or a dumpling. Basically, it's a really versatile meat that the OEO provides, and in my opinion, it tastes really good too. And so I know we've only just started, but uh, maybe I'll ask Nicole if there are any quick questions I can answer before I move on. Well, um, there actually are a few quick questions. Um, James uh, here in Nashville wants to know, what were those two species called again? We call them the round jaw and the sharp jaw. Okay, the round jaw and the sharp jaw. And the sharp jaw is the one that's uh, only uh, in, in Oahu? Uh, only in Hawaii, yes. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right, so we got that We got that out of the way, James. Thanks for clarifying. Sloan wants to know, are bonefish your favorite fish? Um, that's, that's a hard one. Um, they're definitely in the top three. I'd say probably in the top two. I, I enjoy catching them. I enjoy studying them. And I do like to eat them too occasionally. So, yeah. <laughs> What's the other fish? Um, it would probably be the Ulua, which is kind of the most coveted fish here in the islands. Yes, I'm familiar with those. Uh, Kalani wants to know how many Oeo are there in Hawaii altogether? In, in terms of species, there are only these two the round jaw and the sharp jaw, but there are other species throughout the world. Um, throughout the Pacific, you know, in Florida and the Bahamas and some of the other Pacific islands as well. But only two here. Um, I think maybe he might have been asking how many, like population-wise, do you know how many there oh, are? Oh, um, we, I wouldn't be able to give you an exact answer on the number, but there are, there's a lot, but um, 
Yeah, we don't know. I'm, I'm willing to bet someone on the webinar working for NOAA is going to let us know that. So I will uh, we'll circle back on that one, Kalani. Um, Sophia wants to know, are bonefishes in danger? Um, they're not endangered. Um, there's the ones that are endemic, like perhaps the sharp jaw that are found only in one specific place might have a little bit more a higher rank in terms of vulnerability just because they have such a uh, finite geographic location but in general they're they're not in danger we can i think we will um, continue let you continue from there and i'll keep holding on to questions sure sounds good okay thank you for those questions so what i basically wanted to do today was share with you about the bonefish life cycle and the different habitats or you know the places and environments that they live in. But I also wanted to use my life cycle as an example in my the different environments I have been in to illustrate how we might study a fish's life cycle. So let's just say this is my basic life cycle. We all know that we start off with birth as a baby. This is not me, but I'd like to think at one point I was also this cute and quiet and calm. And then, you know, we grow up to be a child. So for me, I started fishing when I was about four years old, trying to catch tilapia in every river or stream or pond possible. And then, you know, we move on to high school. That's, you know, next milestone. And I went to a really small school in Uwanu on Oahu called Hawaii Baptist Academy. And then I was lucky enough to go away for college. So I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Washington in Seattle. And then for my adult life, I moved back home to the islands where I did some graduate research at the University of Hawaii and now in the current job I am in now as the fisheries extension agent. Keith, before you move on, um, maybe you can point out that fish you mentioned a second ago. I can see oh, it in one of the pictures. Good point. Yes, this is the uh, Ulua I was mentioning. And this is a, a picture of me actually in Fiji and I was actually supposed to be in Fiji right now. <laughs> That, that trip got canceled. But yes, this is the Ulua, what they call it, the giant trevally. Cool, thank you. Yeah, good point. Okay, so that was my life cycle in terms of age, but now let's kind of frame it in terms of the environment. So as many of you know, this is the Hawaiian Islands, and I grew up here on Oahu, outlined in red. And I was born and raised in a town called Kaneohe on the eastern end of Oahu, and my parents still live there. And so when they look out their kitchen window, this is what they get to see. They see the beautiful Ko'olau Mountains, and it's the windward side of the island, so things are, you know, they get a little bit more rain than other parts of the island, so things are really green. And so this was the first environment that I grew up in. And then, as I mentioned, for college, I moved away. So I traveled almost 3,000 miles to the Pacific Northwest to Seattle. And on weekends, I'd go you know, snowboarding with my friends. But this is something I'd see fairly regularly. And as you can see, there's snow. It's actually below freezing, really cold. So a completely different environment than what I was living in before in Kaneohe. And as you can imagine, a kid from Hawaii experiencing this, it was really, really different. But after college, I ended up moving home, but not to Kaneohe. I actually moved into Honolulu, the base of Manoa. And now when I look out my window, this is what I see. So it's a little bit more of a, a concrete jungle. You know, I've got more buildings and, and schools and things like that. So, I, you know, it's still Oahu, but as you can tell, it's very, very different from Kaneohe. So my environment, has changed throughout my life. And who knows, it, you know, it might, might change again. And so I wanna take that basic idea of, you know, the life cycle and the different places I was living and use that to describe a fish's life cycle. You know, we could talk about other species of fish and their habitats, but I'm gonna use bonefish as the example today. And so for bonefishes, or for fish in general, we, we often say that the first step is spawning. And so this is when the fishes release their eggs. And this is an example here. And then those eggs hatch into larvae. And I'll touch a little bit later about what those are. And then those larvae transform into juveniles or baby fish. And then those baby fish grow up to be adults. And so what I'm going to do is talk about these different 
life stages and the different habitats or the places that the fish are living um, through their life cycle. And before I, I kind of hop into the meat of the presentation, maybe I'll ask Nicole if there are any quick questions again. Uh, well, very quickly, um, Okinda wanted to know why uh, the sharp jaw is only in Hawaii. So that's a good question. It's perhaps not really easy to describe quickly, but basically, you know, a lot of Hawaii is really isolated. You know, we're really far from other uh, countries and other big land masses. So sometimes when fish get here through their larval stage, Sometimes there's speciation that occurs where they, they came as one species and then they've diverted somehow um, in terms of their, their DNA or genetic traits. And so that's often how we have a handful, not a handful, quite a few endemic fish plants here. Got it. Um, Caitlin would like to know how long can they live? So they can actually live pretty long. Uh, one of the oldest I've aged was about 16 years old. So these fish can at least grow up to be teenagers. Um, it's probably older than a lot of maybe the students tuning in on here today. So relatively old. Okay. And Ellie, thanks Ellie. She's looked it up and she thinks there are about 7,500 bonefish in Hawaii, but she's not sure if that's the population of just the sharp jaw or both species. So does that sound right to you? Um, I'd have to guess there would be more, but I'm, I don't do stock assessments or, or anything like that, so I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Are you going to talk a little bit about bonefish predators? Um, I'm not, but perhaps at the end I, I can answer some questions about that. Okay. I'll hold on to that one and just let you continue for now. Thank you. Okay. Cool. All right. So for this the bonefish life cycle, I want to use Monolua Bay as a case study. So this is Oahu here. Monolua Bay is located on the south shore, outlined in this red box. And I've blown it up here. And so for those of you that are familiar, this is the iconic Diamond Head. And then we've got Hanama Bay on the other side. So all of this in between is Hanama Bay. And so as we mentioned, as I mentioned, the first step in their life cycle spawning. So bonefish is actually go really far offshore and to the deep ocean where they release their eggs. And I have a quick clip here. So this is compliments of the Bonefish Tarpon Trust. They allowed me to show a video they had of a bonefish school in the Bahamas. But this is basically what they do. They form these really big, what they call pre-spawning aggregations, but massive school of fish move offshore at night and spawn on certain moon phases. And so they do this really, really, really far out in the deep. And so the first habitat or first environment that the bonefish encounters is this open ocean. So this is, if you can imagine, just being dropped into the middle of the ocean and all you could see is just blue. You know, it's too deep to see the, the sand, the rocks on the bottom, and all you can see is just blue. That's the first habitat that the bonefish experiences. And so when those eggs hatch and they turn into larvae, they swim as far inshore as they can. They go all the way out from the open ocean and they wiggle their way inshore. And one of the habitats that they like is this lagoon here that we call Pico Lagoon. And this is just basically a habitat that's really far inshore, it's calm, it's protected. You know, there aren't a lot of predators here. It's relatively shallow, and it's just a good place for them to hang out and grow up before the juvenile stage. But I also wanted to just take a quick moment and talk about fish larvae. I know maybe some of you aren't familiar with that term, but it's basically the, the phase right before they turn into the juvenile, or at least the form of a fish that we'd recognize. And oftentimes, these larvae don't look anything like their adult form. So I wanted to ask you all if you can guess which one of these four is a bonefish larvae. So maybe you can type in the chat either one, two, three, or four. Okay, Luke thinks it's two. 
Duncan thinks it's for, oh my gosh, they're coming in so fast. Um, wow, we're getting all kinds of uh, different answers, actually. Um, a lot of people, let's see, Cassandra, Brianna, Michael, Miles, I'll think it's four. Kara says three. James says four. Kyle says two. Um, Ellis says one. Uh, Kalani says two. So we're, we're getting... Um, I would say a high number of fours uh, and uh, a lot of twos. All right. Well, let me just go through them really quick and reveal what they actually are. So, number one, this larval fish is actually an uku or a green job fish. This is one of our, our deep water snappers. They live in relatively deep depths where it's a lot darker, but it's a good, good eating fish. And then number two, I know a handful guessed that. This is actually a needlefish, or what we call an aha. And I believe people on the mainland might know it more as a blue bone or a houndfish. They've got a lot of really sharp teeth in their long mouth there. And then number three, this is perhaps something we're a little more familiar with, something you might have seen in the fish market or had at a restaurant. And this is a mahi-mahi or a dolphin fish. This little fella here is going to grow up to be one of the faster growing fishes in the sea. And then, as you might have guessed, our last one is the winner. So number four is our bonefish. So it's hard to believe this weird looking creature here is going to grow up to be a full size bonefish, but incredibly it, it does. So I just want to dive in a little bit more about the larvae. And Oftentimes, some of the folks at our science center, they go out on research cruises and catch larvae with nets, but there's other ways to catch fish larvae as well. Luckily, they're attracted to light, or a lot of them are attracted to light. And so this is like if you've walked out on a warm night and seen termites swarming around the street light, or maybe a moth, you know, in the evening hitting its face against a, your house light or something like that. That same activity or phenomenon happens underwater. So I have a quick clip here to illustrate that. And so I just put a light down in some shallow water so I could film it. But in a matter of seconds, all these little critters show up and they're baby shrimp, they're baby crabs, baby fish, and they're all attracted to this light. And so actually just out of pure luck, there is a bonefish larvae that shows up. It's a little hard to see. And this is its head moving here. And then that rainbow that lights up is actually the bonefish larvae. So as you can tell, they're actually quite clear, or they're practically transparent. And so I have another clip here showing them swimming around in a little viewing box that a friend made for me. So they don't really look like a fish, as you can see. They move more like, a, like an eel or like a snake or something. Almost everything except for their head is, you know, you can practically see through them. So pretty incredible that, that this, creature is going to transform into a bonefish one day. All right. So that was the larval stage. And then we move on to the juvenile. So they transform into a juvenile and they actually like to hang out in the deeper channels. So instead of, you know, this is Pico Lagoon, they actually like to hang out in more of the deeper sections. And where we typically find them is, it's called an estuary. And so it's a little hard to describe a picture, but basically an estuary is an area where we've got some fresh water that's meeting the ocean, the salt water. And so there might be a stream or it might be groundwater that's coming out, but Mauna Loa Bay has a handful of these estuary type environments. And so the juveniles like to hang out in some of these deeper spots where it's, it's safe, it's protected, and estuaries are often characterized as a productive area with a lot of food. Okay, so this is actually what they look like when they first transform into a fish. So it's still, you know, a little, little bit clear, but at least looks like a recognizable fish now with its you know, different fins and its tail. And once it's at least several inches long, they look like the adult, but just a lot smaller. Okay, and then for the adult phase, much like me, these adults can swim maybe wherever they want. You know, I moved away for school. They can leave these areas and 
basically hang out wherever they'd like. They have fewer predators at that size. And we found here in Hawaii, especially for the round jaws, that they like these inshore flats. And these flats are areas where they feed. And as you can see, it's actually really shallow. You know, you can see the bottom. And so they're maybe a foot deep or several feet deep, you know, nothing like the open ocean that they were first born in. And so this is where they like to frequent on a day-to-day -day basis. And the way that we've studied, or one of the ways that we've studied the adults in the past is through a tagging project that was run out of the university here. And it was basically volunteer anglers that would tag fish. So there was almost a thousand anglers tagging over 4,000 fish with the idea of that when you tag a fish, you hope that it gets caught again. So they had quite a few recaptures as well. And so this tag here would have, it had a phone number on it, and a specific ID number. And so we'd measure the fish from the tip of its nose to the middle of its tail with the hopes that, you know, once we catch it, we tag it, we see how long it is, and then we let it go. And so with the hopes of it, someone else catching that same fish, and then we can see what habitats it used, but, and also how much it grew during that time. And so a lot of, we got a lot of information just out of a simple tag, tagging project like this. Um, maybe before I go on, Nicole, would now be a, a good time to check for questions again? Yeah, we've got a few, if, you, um, if you're inclined. Um, let's see, Seicheb wants to know, what, v, what fish family does the bonefish classify to? Fish family. So they are, their scientific name is Albula glossodonna, or at least that's the one here, that's the round jaw. And the sharp jaws are Albula vergata. And I believe the family, uh, don't quote me on this, might be a, a lot before me, but basically they are a group of fish that have that unique larval stage. So not only bonefish have that, you know, really snaky eel-like larval stage, but there are other ones like that as well. Okay. Um, what do bonefish eat, Coralie wants to know? Uh, good question. So bonefishes, I might as well take a quick tangent, but I have a, a skull here of a bonefish, and hopefully you can see that, but they don't really have teeth. Oh, so could you do me a favor, Keith? If you stop sure. sharing your presentation for one second, oh, okay. we will we'll be able to see you bigger. There you go. Now okay. hold that up again. Cool. Yeah. So as you can see, they kind of have like sandpaper on their lips. And they don't, so this kind of tells you maybe they're not, you know, chasing and tearing down fish. And they actually have these crushers on the top of their mouth, which are these kind of dot looking things. But those are basically really hard and their tongue has that same material and they use that to crush crabs and things like that. And so this might be an example. This is just a preserved crab, but you know, crabs are hard, right? And they eat other kinds of shellfish. So they need a way to be able to crush all those all those types of uh, invertebrates. Oh, we're getting a lot of cools on that one. So good good prop. Um, you can go back to sharing your screen if you want while I ask you a few more questions. Um, let's see. Um, I forget who this question came from. Well, Paul wants to know why are they called bonefishes if you can't see their bones? <laughs> That's a good question. I. I don't have a, a good answer for that, but bonefishes are, they are really bony. They're not a fish you can just fillet like a, a tuna. You actually, do it. what people do is you actually have to scrape the meat out just because there's so many bones. I mean, I know there's other fishes that are, are bony as well, but yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure why they're called bonefish. And oh, since we got a question from Sophia, I think we might need to explain these tags one more time while you're still looking at them. So sure. Sophia wants to know, if the fish goes to a place with no Wi-Fi, how do you keep track of it? <laughs> so these are these are really basic tags. There are more expensive tags that, you know, relay information up to satellites, but these are just dark tags. So the idea is that this type of project involves the community and it involves a lot of fishermen 
but when they catch it, they'll just call the phone number that's on it, and then they'll read the ID number and give us the fish length. And so that information, there's there's a various tagging projects ongoing here in Hawaii for other species as well. But yeah, these tags don't don't require a um, Wi-Fi. They're similar to maybe the bands you see on a, a bird's you know leg or the little clip tags on a, a seal or something like that. Yeah, Sophia, that's like uh, the bands that are on the albatross that uh, Jennifer told us about last week. So uh, important, important question there. Um, Kara wants to know, did the tags hurt the fish? So we, we think of it as, as somewhat of a, a piercing. They don't seem to mind too much. Um, fish tagging has been done for, for quite a while with a lot of different fish species. And it's a, a small trade-off for a lot of good information that we get. And it's a really good project to involve the fishing community in the science and management process. Okay, I have a really good question from Louise. She wants to know, do bonefish have good eyesight? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know the official answer for it, but I'd say they just have good senses in general. When I fish for them, it seems they can see me really well, but I think they're also sensing sensing us. Um, they can you know, feel us through different means like their lateral line, but their eyesight isn't amazing. And they're also not typically looking far. They're looking down and rooting around for, for food in the, in the sand and in the substrate. Okay, Levi wants to know, how do you tell if a bonefish is a he or a her? So that's a good question. It's often difficult for a lot of fish, but for bonefishes, we don't typically know until they are opened up. Um, there is a good video by the Bonefish Tarpon Trust online where they actually are able to kind of massage the bonefish a little bit and they can, based on, you know, if it expels eggs, then they know that it's a female, but there aren't visible external Kind of characteristics to let us know. All right, good questions, guys. And I'm sure if there's a video out there that we can put on the website, Grace will find it and get it up there for you guys. All right, so go ahead and continue, Keith. I'll hold the rest of the questions. Okay. So, all right. Well, speaking of questions, I have a, a quick one for you all. So we talked about you know how bonefish are tagged and their different like history characteristics and where they live at different life stages. Well, let's just say a bonefish is tagged here at this red star, right smack dab in the middle of Monolulu Bay. Where do you think it's most likely to be recaptured or caught again? So would it be caught at that red star again, at the black star, maybe a yellow star off Waikiki, green star near our airport, blue star in Pearl Harbor, or a purple star off of Eva Beach? And you can just type okay, in the color got star. Okay, so we got lots of choices here. So this is so where so it's caught at the red star, Keith. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's caught at the red star. Where do you think it's going to go? Um, is it going to be recaptured right where it was caught, or at one of these other locations? And while we're waiting for everyone to answer with their color, um, are there recaptures on other islands? Yes. As a matter of fact. Uh, their fish are tagged on all of the islands. And well, I guess maybe not all, all of the main inhabited islands. And there are a handful that have traveled in between islands. And those are typically the sharp jaws or the endemic bonefish that are moving in between islands. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, so Alicia says purple, Ella says black. We're getting a yellow, a green, uh, it's like a rainbow here, Keith. Everybody, it's all Perfect. over the place. Um, so we don't have any. Um, Nicole says it's green. Craig says it's green. Chloe says it's green. We're getting a lot of greens right now. So maybe you could let us know. Yeah, so this was, I'll admit, a little bit of a trick question. So it's most likely to be caught again right back at the red star. And so we found out that bonefishes really like to say have 
strong site fidelity. They stick to home basically. So this is like if you had a, a favorite restaurant down the road and you went there, you know, Monday through Friday every day for dinner. That's pretty much what these bonefishes are doing. So whether the bonefish is tagged four days ago or four years ago, it's got pretty much an 80 to 85% chance of being caught in practically the same area. So these fishes really like to stick around the same inshore flat. All right, and so I talked about the life stages. I wanted to take a quick moment and talk about the scale of these creatures that we're talking about. So let's, let's make pretend that this is a, a ruler at the top in inches, so starting at zero. So we know that they start life as an egg, and these eggs are really, really small, but much smaller than an inch big. So we're going to call it zero inches big. And then those eggs hatch and turn into the larvae that we talked about, and they actually grow up to three inches long. So they go from zero inch to one, two, to three. And then believe it or not, when they turn into a juvenile, they shrink. So they go from three inches back down to two and then back down to one. So they start life as a, a regular fish or a baby fish at only an inch long. And then from there, they can grow to over 30 inches. And so, you know us, we would like to just keep growing, but for these fish, they have to grow, shrink, and then grow again. So it's a pretty interesting thing that they go through. Keith, before you move yeah. off the slide, um, could you, or either one of those slides would be useful because we're get, we got a few questions about how long these different stages are in terms of time. Oh, good question. Okay, yeah, so these eggs, we know that they, they're out in the open. Before they hatch, they, it's maybe about two days or a few days. And then when they turn into this larvae, they're actually in this stage for maybe two to three months. Then, so once they're here, they, you know, they're three, four months old. And then, you know, those big bonefish that are 30 inches long or somewhere in their, you know, mid to late teens. So good question. Okay, so I just wanted to recap really quick about what we learned in terms of their life cycle and their habitat. So from spawning, you know, this is when the eggs are released. Those eggs hatch and turn into larvae. And those larvae transform into little juveniles or baby fish, and then they grow up to be adults. And they live at different places in different parts of their life. So as we learned, right, for spawning, those eggs are out in the open ocean, and that's where the larvae start too. But those larvae like to move to really far inshore places, calm, protected lagoons or ponds. And then they transform into juveniles where they use estuary habitats. And then they mainly hang out on our inshore flats. So as you can see, this is just, you know, one type of fish and it's using multiple habitats. So the habitat is really important to fish in general. And so at NOAA Fisheries, they aim to protect and restore coastal habitat. Because if you have good habitat, you know, good homes for the fishes, that will help support healthy fish populations. And unfortunately, we do have a handful of threats to our habitat. This is something that's all too familiar for us here in Hawaii when it rains really hard. This brown water in our rivers and streams makes it straight out into the ocean and kind of you know, makes the water really brown out there. Or we might have disease or even boats or anchors that break coral. And these take a long time to grow back. I know some of you have learned a lot about coral bleaching in a previous webinar, but you know, there's thermal stressors that cause the coral to expel their algae. And then invasive algae are invasive algae or invasive species are also a big problem. And in Mauna Loa Bay, we have gorilla ogro that outcompete some of our native algae species. And so there's a handful of different threats that affect our habitat. So NOAA hopes to you know, understand these threats and prevent some of them from happening in order to protect our coastlines and help support healthy fish populations. And so what I wanted to leave you with here today, I'm just going to run this video. And thanks to Celeste and our comms team for putting this together. But it's a restoration atlas. This is something you can all go online and check out. It's a pretty hefty program. So if it, it takes a while to load, just be a little patient. But basically, you can scroll 
all around the United States and check or, you know, in other places in the world too, and check what types of habitat projects are happening near you. Some of them have happened before, some are ongoing, or there's even some that you can participate in yourself. So maybe I'll pause it here. And, you know, for some of you in the, you know, Massachusetts area, you can see all these yellow icons or something you can click on. Oops. And, you know, you can see what types of habitat projects are happening near you. And oftentimes we think of habitat as, you know, the open ocean, but right this stream here running under a bridge is habitat to some, you know, wildlife. And so habitat is really all around us. So it's kind of, it, kind of, it is definitely important to be aware of our actions because, you know, animals are using the habitat and that we are also using. So that's all I have for you folks today. Thank you very much for listening and tuning in. And if there's time, I'll be happy to take some questions. Great, Keith, thank you. Um, so if you wanna turn your, perfect, that's perfect. Yeah. Now we can see you nice and big. Um, I have to tell you, there are a few fishermen online hoping to get some, um, some spots from you and some, um, <laughs> some inside scoops about where to fish and 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 so I think I'm gonna let you uh, look at those after the webinar and you can decide whether you think you want to respond to those folks. Um, but obviously, um, I, my husband and I used to fish for bonefish a lot on Oahu ourselves, and um, you might want to comment a little bit about uh, in terms of the Hawaiian Islands, um, where are the best places to fish for bonefish? In yeah, other words, so, yeah, go ahead. I'll leave it there. Okay, yeah, so Oahu has a lot of those inshore flats. Olokai has some as well. Some of the other Hawaiian islands, like, you know, the big island, it's, I won't get into the um, history of the islands, but basically we have a lot of these shallow flats and that's a lot of the habitat that the bonefish like to use. And so if you just find some of these shallow flats, that's definitely you know, candidates for places to, to find bonefish, but they can also be caught in those deeper areas. So it's a pretty diverse fishery where some people will fish for them off of boats in deep channels or even off of kayaks. Got a pretty strong fly fishing industry that is growing here as well. So they can be caught in quite a variety of places. It's a very good answer, Keith, very diplomatic. Um, so actually that, that circles back to a question that came in early on about how deep bonefish will go. Um, and you just mentioned the boat fishing. So what, what sort of depths are you talking about? So, I mean, we know that the adult sharp jaws really like to hang out in some of these deeper areas. I'm not sure if I could give you an exact number in terms of depth, but you know, if the, the shallow flats are, you know, one to 10 feet deep, you can still catch them in, you know, 10 to 50 to 100 feet. Um, and since they do travel, we have seen some travel in between islands. We do know that they're willing to cross some really, really deep water. Oh, that's good information. Oh, I should put myself back up so you're not talking to yourself. Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, so what uh so some of the other questions i got here so grace uh put the restoration atlas up on the website so for folks that um, wanted to check that out and you're part of the world that's up on um the NOAA live site um do people ever eat the larvae or the juvenile bonefish so that's a good question and i know in some places bonefish are a designated sport fish where you can only practice catch and release, or maybe you can only take one. But in Hawaii, you are allowed to eat bonefishes, but we do have a minimum size. So that means they have to be 14 inches long from the tip of their nose to the fork of their tail. So I know it might be hard in terms of scale, but this is 14 inches long. And so you are not allowed to eat the larvae or the bone, uh, or the juveniles, but you wouldn't want to anyway, just cause you know, not a lot of meat on those fish at that size. 
Yeah, so the little ones that you showed the pictures of, um, people would not be eating those. Um, how, uh, someone asked at what maturity are they when they spawn? So how old are they when they start to have babies? So in terms of age, I, I believe it's around three-ish years old, give or take. Um, in terms of length, it's about 19 inches long. And of course, there's there's variability on either side. But we call that the uh, L50. It's the length at which 50% of the fish are mature. And so, yeah, it's about 19 inches long or, or at least a few years old. Okay. Um, so one thing you haven't talked about, but Lydia would love to know what you like most about your job. Uh, let's see. Well, in terms of my job, I mentioned in that first slide, I work with different stakeholders, different groups of people. And I think that's probably the best part of it. I don't do just one thing. As a fisheries extension agent, I get to do a little of everything. You know, I work with the protected species folks because, you know, fishermen interact with you know, turtles or monk seals. And of course, I get to work with the fishermen, helping connect them to scientists to get you know, samples to maybe study a certain species. So that's really the beauty of it is that I get to do a little bit of everything, including, you know, give talks like this, you know, some education and outreach. Great. Um, so Rick wants to know, are the two Hawaiian species of bonefish commonly found together? So that's a good question. In general, they do segregate. They So they keep keep separate. So the Juveniles of the sharp jaws are actually, you know, we can find them in the shallow areas, you know, right off the beach or something like that. And then the adults hang out in the deep. And for the round jaws, it's the opposite, where the juveniles are hanging out in the deep and the adults are in the shallow. So it's kind of a little bit of a, a flip-flop there. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, Duncan wants to know, can they survive in fresh water and salt water? So they wouldn't do well in fresh water, but we know since they use those estuarine or the estuary environments, they can be in brackish water, which is a mix of fresh and salt water, but it's still, I guess in easier terms, closer to salt water than it is fresh water. Okay. Um, so Richard says, when I fly fish for bonefish, I walk out on the flats. Does walking on the flats harm the habitat? So that is a good question. And I guess it, it depends. Some places are a lot of just sand and, you know, rubble and things like that. But if you're, if you walk further out the flat and there's areas where there's coral heads and things like that, we like to encourage people to maybe not be that far out just because we don't want them to step or break coral but near to shore is usually is usually okay hmm. um let's see luke is very concerned about um whether you can get salmonella from eating raw bonefish salmonella i've never heard of that being an issue um i've also never heard of anybody getting sick from eating bonefishes but that doesn't mean it can't happen. So I'd say, yeah, there's low low risk or low chance of that happening. So you mentioned that um, a lot of people eat bonefish um, in the islands. Um, and is that something that um, you don't really go to the store and buy it, right? I mean, there's uh, folks who are catching and preparing and sharing it with friends and family. Is that typically how that's done? Yeah. it's. It's more of what you mentioned, more of people catching, preparing, and sharing. There are some places that still sell whole bonefish in the store, or you can buy the prepared form, that Lomi OEO, where it's raw and it's got some ingredients, different ingredients mixed in there. But yes, for the most part, it's a lot of people sharing. So. Gotcha. Um, and then earlier we talked about that you were going to discuss predators of bonefish. There's a few folks that want, still want to hear about that. Yeah, so in other places, um, like in the South Pacific or even places in the Caribbean or Atlantic, there 
are a lot of sharks that kind of maybe hone in on these spawning aggregations. And so if you caught a bonefish and released it, sometimes they're a little tired and that makes them vulnerable to sharks. That doesn't happen as much here. Uh, when we release fish, especially on the shallow flats, there aren't um, a whole lot of sharks on the flats, but other places that's a lot more prevalent. So I guess long story short, it does happen, but not as much in Hawaii. Okay. Um, is there a possibility of mercury poisoning in bonefish? So in, for me, I associate mercury with, you know, those really, really large body fishes that live kind of out in the open ocean that live a really long time. So in terms of mercury, I can't say for sure, but I say no, but there's a actually a current project going on with a researcher at the University of Hawaii to study contaminants in fishes in Mauna Loa Bay, and that's currently ongoing. So hopefully when that work comes out, we can you know, share that publicly. So Alicia, who I assume is uh, on Oahu, wants to know whether you ever do school service learning projects with kids? Um, what, what does that exactly entail, service learning projects? Uh, well, I guess we'll have to see if Alicia will clarify, but um, I suspect it's, uh, you know, to edu some field trips to talk to kids about habitat uh, conservation and some of the things you highlighted in your last slide. Yeah, I, well, I guess before we had some, you know, physical restrictions, I was going, giving presentations at schools and I, you know, participate in some fishing club events and uh, bigger events like ocean expos here. But yeah, I'm always happy and willing to talk about fish and fishing and habitat with whoever would like. Okay, well, we'll make sure that um, that we put you and Alicia in touch. I think she's talking about helping, learning how to tag fish and access data um, related to the tagging program. Um, let's see. <laughs> Wow, there are a lot of questions about where the best place is to fish for bonefish on Oahu. <laughs> um, so Cameron, he's only 11, but he wants to know where do we fish for bonefish on Windward Oahu? So Windward Oahu, well, I'd say I have caught bonefish from Waimanalo all the way up to Kahana, which is like almost the entire stretch of the east coast of Oahu. So they, they are definitely around and, you know, they like to, you know, feed on those shallow flats. So if you can find some of those shallow flats that you can safely access, um, those definitely would be good places to, to go. So what do you think kids, Does, do you think Keith is an experienced fisherman or do you think, do you think all those rods behind him belong to him? or there's somebody else's. I think they're probably his. I, I suspect that Keith is out there a lot. So if you go fishing on Oahu, you might run into him. Um, let's see. And so a, a couple of folks are asking about where they can volunteer. So we'll make sure that you um, we put them in touch with you. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time today. It was so fun um, just no seeing all the pictures and, and sites from Oahu and also just talking to you. and. Um, on Friday, we have another NOAA colleague from the Pacific Islands, Cindy, is going to be talking to us about tsunamis. So um, if you are interested in that weather piece, please come back on Friday. Um, and Keith, we just want to thank you again, Mahalo, for sharing what you love and do for NOAA, and um, happy fishing. Of course, no problem. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. See, bye, everybody.